מעל ומעבר עשו לנו באמת את ה... באמת מעל ומעבר למה שציפינו, אז באמת שיש לנו את הזכות שיהיה איתנו כמה ימים יחזק אותנו. אני הייתי רוצה את תאיר, הרב ירון. לא, צריך לצאת. חבוד, חבוד. ברשות הרב, ברשותכם, בעזרת השם, נעשה ונצליח. השיעור הזה יהיה גם לעילוי נשמת. אתי אסתר כהן, בת יהודית, בעזרת השם, גם לרפואה שלמה. לטליה, בת השרה, רבנית שרה, בת ענת, רב אפרים בן שולמית, אבי מורי דוד בן עשריה, אמי מורתי דוריס, בת ז'ורה, וכל עם ישראל, בעזרת השם, השם יברך את כולכם. אגיד לכם כמה דברי תורה, לא יודע כמה זמן יהיה, אבל בעזרת השם נעשה ונצליח. אז שמעתי היום... Oh, you want Hebrew or English? English. English, English. Okay, so I heard today that uh, the uh, rabbi from uh, OU, OU is perhaps the most powerful Jewish organization on planet Earth. You know, it's the kashrut. They do a lot of things, a lot of good things, Baruch Hashem. If you're eating, then you probably rely on them. But they did something that... Uh, Everyone has to ask their question after you hear this. They did something where they got 180,000 signatures of Jewish people, leaders of some kind, you know, successful people, and they sent it to Biden, to President Biden, to influence him to uh, become more friendly to the Jewish people. Now, how many of you think that this is a good thing? Raise your hand. Good thing, bad thing, okay. Now, if we look at what happened just about almost 80 years ago, before the Holocaust, we see Jewish leaders did exactly the same thing. When the Germans, Yimach Shimam Vezicham, the Amalek, wanted to tell us that they don't like us, what did they do? They kicked us out. They told us leave. But the Jewish people didn't want to leave. They didn't want to leave. Some left, most people stayed. Why? They have houses, they have businesses, they have cars, they have this, they have that. They don't want to leave. What do they do? They send letters to the president. They send letters to the press. They send letters to all types of things. And did it help us? Oh, six million people died. I don't think it helped. So the question that you should have in your mind is, what is more of something that will have more likely to succeed, something that's more significant in the eyes of Hashem? Getting 180,000 Jewish people to sign a letter to say that we're not happy with the way things are going, we're not happy that you've become virtually Muslim without becoming a sheikh, or to get one Jew to keep Shabbat. One Jew to keep Shabbat versus 180,000 signatures. Now, I don't have, you don't have to answer me, but if the answer that you gave in your mind, even if it's not on purpose, is 180,000 Signatures, according to the Torah, you have a very serious problem. According to the Torah, you have a very serious problem. Why? One Jew keeping Shabbat is worth more than this entire world put together. The problem is that most people don't realize that. Not necessarily because they didn't go to yeshiva. Even people that go to yeshiva. Even the people that go to yeshiva. You know, the people that got the 180,000 signatures, they want the yeshiva. They have yeshivot. So it's not necessarily a thing that you learn in yeshiva. There's a certain ashkafa, there's a certain ideology that a person has to not only learn, but they have to live by. Now, Baruch Hashem, there's many Jews today, since October 7th, have started to wake up and started realizing that uh, perhaps life is not guaranteed, not to anybody. And uh, they started listening to Shurei Torah, they started doing tshuva, some people started keeping Shabbat, Baruch Hashem, so things are moving. Now, when they start listening to Shuret Torah, sometimes they hear, you know, good things, you're great, you're wonderful, Hashem loves you, all that good stuff. And sometimes they hear, Mechalel Shabbat, death penalty. Somebody that uh, goes to a, uh, you know, a party where girls and boys are dancing together, according to the Torah, death penalty. Uh, somebody that uh, worships money and goes uh, makes money on Shabbat instead of, uh, you know, instead of going to shul, death penalty, all types of death penalties. A lot of threats, a lot of threats in the Torah. So he doesn't really like it. I don't want to hear threats. Why can't the Torah be nice? Why can't Hashem be nice to me? Just tell me I love you. Be like Santa Claus. Only comes once he gives presents. Sounds a good deal. So he likes presents. So he doesn't like the Mechal of Shabbat. He doesn't like the uh, other things that say death penalty. He doesn't like... All the threats that we see in Parashat Kitavo, Parashat 
Bechukotai, Parashat Tazino, and pretty much every single parasha that we have in the Torah talks about these things. The second parasha that a kid learns once he starts learning Torah, he's five, six years old. First parasha, the world is created. Second parasha, the world is destroyed. How? In the most awful way possible. So when a person hears some of these things, it's like, no, no, I look. Oh, Hashem, you very much. Let's say it is. One of the chachamim of the generations give me tits. Uh, this is what you guys have over here. Uh, so when a person when a person uh, hears the death penalty, the punishment, he doesn't really like it. So he wants to find a rabbi. You know, we call it in Hebrew, uh, Rav Mahmad. What's Rav Mahmad? He only tells me things that I like. He tells me emunah. He tells me bitachon. He tells me Hashem loves you no matter what you do. There's even a rabbi today. It's one of the most popular heretics on planet earth, but he's a rabbi. Uh, and he says, Hashem needs you. Not only Hashem loves you, Hashem needs you. Meaning that after a Mashiach comes or after a person dies, instead of you saying, I'm sorry, Hashem, I screwed up a few things, I did this, I did this and this. No, no, no. Hashem is going to say, I'm sorry to you. Anybody here believe that? According to him and over 500,000 people that listen to him, that subscribe to his channels, all of them believe that Hashem needs him. So we have a, a very serious machloket, very serious debate among Am Yisrael. One of the reasons we have this debate is because most people don't take Torah as seriously as they take the things that are part of their day-to-day -day life. So when you tell them you need to learn Torah every single day, I say, no, why, why do I have to be so stringent? I'm already, you know, keeping the basics. I need masorti. You know, masorti. Rabbi, again, I love shalom. You say masorti. Masorti is like you're cutting the mitzvot with a masor. Every day, masorti. Every day you cut another mitzvah. So he says, oh, I go to shul. I keep Shabbat. I don't kill anybody. Last time I checked, nobody caught me stealing. Uh, you know, and uh, I'm doing okay. So isn't that enough? Let's see. If I asked you guys... If you had a friend, let's say everybody had a friend in school or somebody in school that was like the nerd. You know, wasn't like the popular guy. Wasn't the guy that everybody wanted to hang out with. You know, the guy that sometimes he had a little boogers coming out of his nose. He wasn't really, he dressed with two different socks. You know, it wasn't, it was like uh, almost like the, you know, something a flag for a Muslim country. You're not even sure. How did he pick these colors? He was a little confused. Everybody picked on him. You didn't think this guy's going to make it in life. And you were the popular guy. You were the guy, you got the girls, you got the car, 17 years old, you're driving with one hand, even though two hands you just really, barely you can drive, but you're driving, you're hanging out, you're the popular guy. But this guy, a little nerdy, he's barely gonna make it out of high school. 25 years, 30 years have passed, right? You're driving, you got a nice car, $100,000 car, $500,000, a million dollar house. You feel good. All of a sudden you run into a store, you see this guy telling the people what to do. Who's this guy? Is it manager? Oh, what manager? CEO. What CEO? CEO of who? Oh, he's CEO of the entire chain of stores. You look this guy on the internet. He's a billionaire. The nerd with the little boogies and two different socks, a multi-billionaire. He doesn't drive cars. They drive him. He has planes to go from state to state just for fun to have lunch. He goes to Paris just for the afternoon. He has so much money, he doesn't know what to do with it. So he builds things. Is it going to hurt you a little bit? Is it going to bother you a little bit that this nerd has a little more than you? You were the popular guy. You were the smart one. You got 100 on your math test. You know how to add, how to subtract. Today, you just need to know how to use a calculator. But this guy became a billionaire. You were happy with your $100,000 car until you saw that he's driving a jet for $75 million. You were happy with your million dollar house until you realized that his basement costs more than yours. You were happy until you saw what he has. So the truth is, you were happy until you knew what was available. So when it comes to money, nobody's really happy. Why? The Gemara in Masichet Sukkah says, you give him 100, he wants 200. You give him 200, he wants 400. And nobody's ever going to die with even half of what he wants. If he has a million, he wants two million. If he has 10 million, he feels even more poor than the guy that has one million. Why? Because he wants 10 more million. So in reality, when it comes to money, 
Nobody is happy. Oh, pretend he's happy. You ask him, how you doing? No, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, Shevach Lai, Shevach Lai. He goes home, he goes, I can't believe it. I can't believe they charge $500 for a fish. But you have, 500, you have $500 million, you have $5 million. You're complaining about $500? He's not happy. Why? Something is missing. The problem is, is the missing is not money. The missing part is not money. He just doesn't realize it. So when it comes to material, a person looks at his life, he's happy until he looks at his neighbor. He's happy until he realizes what else is available. People spend a fortune of their time and their money reviewing what everybody else has. How much was the contract that this athlete signed? How much was the team sold for? Oh, did you guys hear that this hedge fund manager bought a team for $5 billion? What do you care? How much did he buy the team? Is he giving you free tickets? Is he giving you a dividend every year the team loses, every year the team wins? What do you care that he bought it for? But people spend an enormous amount of time checking out the statistics, the financial statistics of everybody. You ask the guy, listen, what's the salary cap of the, I don't know, New York Lakers, LA Lakers, whatever their name is? What's the salary cap? He'll tell you. What's the top player in the league make? He'll tell you. He'll even tell you number two, number three, number four. But this guy, don't worry about it. These guys are only making the most money this year. Oh, well, how do you know? No, because next year, this guy, whatever his name is, he saw, he's renewing his deal. For sure, he's going to get $200 million. You already know what the guy, you're like a, you're a fortune teller. You're going to tell people what he's going to make next year. And he asked the guy, let me ask you a question. How many dapim in the Gemara do you know? He said, what? How many dapim in the Gemara? You say, you speak English? Yeah, Gemara, Gemara, Ishtabach Shimolad, Gemara, over there. How many of the dapim do you know? What's a daf? He doesn't know what a daf is. Okay, I'm, forget daf. Have you read any of the books? No, they look pretty though. They're brand new. Why are they brand new? Why are they brand new? Because nobody uses it. Why are you a Jew? Because you have $500 million? Because you have $5 million? Because you have $5? Or because of Gemara? Because of Rashi Tosfot? Because of the Chumash? So you can say, yeah, I'm no, but I keep Shabbat. I don't kill anybody. I didn't get caught for stealing. Because you can't say you don't steal because the Gemara says everybody steals. Why do they, everybody steals? I'm not a thief. No, but because you don't know the Torah, you steal. Because you don't know Torah, you steal. Why? Did you ever have an employee where this employee came to work for you and he had to get paid? But you didn't feel like paying him. But you paid him in the end. But it was like a week later. A week later you paid. You paid the guy. Not a ganav. Not like a highway robbery. But you didn't feel like paying him today. You paid him a week later, a month later. Guess what? For a week, you're a thief. Every single second you're alive for that week, you're a thief. We think in Shabbat, you say, oh, no, no, he was only a thief for a week. It's okay. It's okay. He was only a thief for a week. He's allowed to steal for a week. You think there's any type of court in Shabbat that's going to say that? The problem is when you don't know Torah, you make a lot of violations that you don't know exist. So now if I told you when you arrive... At the bed of Shamayim, they're going to say it wasn't enough to just pray. It wasn't enough to just keep Shabbat and not kill anybody. A person will say, okay, but uh, what, I have to become a rabbi? Who asked you to become a rabbi? The Gemara says there's a machloket between Resh Lakish and his rabbi, Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan says that all of Israel have a share of the world to come. Resh Laki says, yes, but that's Israel. Am Israel, yes. If they're considered part of Am Israel, they have share of the world to come. But the Gemara says in five places, and also you have the Rambam says in uh, Ilchot Shabbat, the last halacha, chapter 30, last halacha, he says, a Jew that violates Shabbat on purpose, drives to drives to synagogue on, to, on Shabbat, like we have in Florida. But Hashem, I don't think you guys have that problem over here, but in Florida we have people drive to shul. They drive to shul on Shabbat. I saw one time guy drive to shul five o'clock in the morning. You want to pray nets. So he drove to shul on Shabbat at five o'clock in the morning. And you see the guy coming out with the seat happy. Like, and you know, and nobody told him. No one told him. For 20 years he's driving to shul. No one told him he's not allowed to drive on Shabbat. So when I told the guy, you're not allowed to drive on Shabbat, he goes, well, I'm going to go to shul. I said, don't go to shul. Shabbat, I'm Jewish. I said, yes, 10 commandments. Doesn't have... 
Number one, believe in God. Number two, don't, you know, no, no, it doesn't say go to shul. There's no number three, number four, number five, go to shul. But there is number four, keep Shabbat. Don't drive on Shabbat. No one ever told him, so he drove on Shabbat. And the Rambam says a Jew that drives on Shabbat, a Jew that does business on Shabbat, is considered an idol worshiper. You know, like the uh, the people that pray to Yoshke, people that pray to some person, look like, look like a rock star, had long hair, with a mustache, they uh, pray to him. They think he's God. You think he's it's stupid, right? Some people have Buddha statues in their front yard. They have a statue in their front yard. That's also an idol. So you think it's stupid too, right? Well, guess what? Driving on Shabbat is also stupid. Why? Idol worshiper, idol worshiper. Same thing. So now if a person looks at this, says, oh, so that's not, so if he's an idol worshiper, he's not considered part of Am Yisrael. It's a problem if he's an idol worshiper. So now... Resh Lakish says, so now we know if he's an idol worshiper, if he's a missionary, if he's uh, all types of things, he's not part of Am Yisrael. Plus, Resh Lakish says, if he doesn't learn Torah, he also has no share of the world to come. So his Rabbi Rabbi Yochanan says, Ay, you're right. Rabbi Yochanan says, you're right. But why'd you say it, he said. Why'd you say it? How we going to get Ami Israel free. Not everybody learns Torah. So Les Lakis comes to Rabbi Yochanan and says, I have a piton for them. I have a, a way out for them. How? Obviously, they have to keep Torah and mitzvot. But what if they don't learn Torah? What's learning Torah? You have to make some time to learn Torah in the morning, a little bit of time at night to learn Torah. No one says you have to learn 18 hours a day. You're not Rabbi Zev. But you can learn an hour in the morning. You can learn an hour at night. Oh, Hashem, Ishtabach Shimolat. You do your business honestly. You're an ethical person. You don't steal. You don't do the things that are forbidden. You don't go to the beach with uh, naked girls over there. You don't go and drive on Shabbat. You don't go to uh, mixed dancing parties. You don't do the things that are outright forbidden. You're fine. But if a person says, no, but I just want to do halfway. So how come the financial statement, you don't like it that it's halfway. The financial statement, no one's happy with halfway. No one's happy that they're not the billionaire. So Resh Lakish says, the pitaron for the people, the solution for the the people that are not learning Torah is at least to invest in Torah. Invest in Torah. They take certain money, they invest into Avrichim, into Kolels, to help other people to learn on their behalf. Now, if a person looks at some of this, they realize that every single person has to make a small change. Some people bigger change, some people smaller changes. Some people, they don't want to change. They want to stay the same. Now, if you were ever in a court case, and you won the court case. First thing that everybody always says is, thank you very much, Baruch Hashem. But somebody asks you, how'd you win? What do you mean, how'd I win? It's the emet, it's the truth. The truth is what won. Oh, so you like the emet. You like the truth. Yeah, of course, what? That's the truth, it's what I want. Oh, okay. So everybody likes the truth. The problem with the truth is only one problem. There's only problem with, one problem with the truth. It's amazing. Everybody loves it. Everybody wants it, except when it's about them. A person does not see a deficiency in himself. Meaning, everybody likes the truth until it affects you. Where you say, listen, when you talk about other people, oh, yeah, they're idol worshippers. You're right, emet. Oh, they're thieves. Emet. They're, uh, you know, killers. Emet. The Shabbat is not good. And the guy who drives on Shabbat says, oh, well, why would you have to say that? Wait, oh, you're, you're, I didn't know you drive on Shabbat. I didn't know you drive on Shabbat. Well, you don't like the truth anymore? Until now, you said, emet, emet, emet. You like, you cheered us on. You were like the cheerleader for free. But until he said, you're not allowed to go to a mixed beach, now all of a sudden you don't like the emet. All of a sudden, when you hear that it affects you, you don't like the emet. But that's the Torah. The Torah is the chotemet of the Torah. The signature of the Torah is the Kadosh Baruch Hu, is emet. Meaning it doesn't change just because you don't like it. It doesn't change because of the times. It doesn't change because for whatever reason or another people think it doesn't fit. The Torah is the Torah. So now when a person looks at the Torah, he has to start thinking about whether they're going to continue lying to themselves or they're going to make certain changes to stop living a lie. Everyone is living a lie to a certain extent. The more you know of the truth, 
the more you realize that there's certain parts of your life that are a lie. You're making, uh, you're, you're, you're making a fool out of yourself. So the first thing is the famous statement that everybody knows, Kol Yisrael Aravim All of Am Yisrael are responsible for each other. What does that mean? The Gemara in Masechet Kiddushin says that if you do one mitzvah, it's a big deal. Any mitzvah that you do. Like for example, if somebody called you for pikuach nefesh in the middle of a shiur, and you answered the call to go save a life. That's a mitzvah. Even though Torah is greater than the uh, pikuach nefesh, but still, let's say you're doing a mitzvah. Fine. You did a mitzvah. That mitzvah is not only good for you. That mitzvah is for all of Am Yisrael. All of Am Yisrael benefits because now the scale of mitzvot got heavier than the sins. So your mitzvah becomes something that helps all of Am Yisrael. On the other hand, if a person, instead of coming to Yeshua Torah, goes to watch basketball games, he makes a sin. It's called Bitul Torah. So now that sin doesn't only affect him, it affects all of Am Yisrael. All of Am Yisrael gets affected by it. So now, a person has to start looking at things. Being 50-50, or only 20% religious. I'm only religious as long as it requires for me to just go to shul and then leave me alone. I'm only religious as long as you pretty much don't tell me what to do. I'm only religious as long as they have kosher food. If they have kosher food, I'll eat it. If it's not, if they don't have kosher food, then whatever goes. If he's only, if he's religious only to a certain condition, that's a problem. Why? Because that sin doesn't only affect you personally, it affects all of Amisrael. And since October 7th, Am Yisrael wants to be united. Am Yisrael wants to be, wants to hug each other. Why? Because you saw a bunch of Jews get killed, get murdered, get raped, get uh, taken as hostages. Everybody cried. Everybody wanted to do something about it. One sin can cause all of that. One mitzvah can save all of that. So now all of a sudden the value of the mitzvot and the value of the sins changes. Why? Because it's not only about you. You learning Torah for one more minute. Instead of pressing play to listen to some rap music. Or press play to listen to the news. Which is only Lashon Ara. If it's not Lashon Ara, then it's not the news. It's old. Instead of doing that, you press play on a Shiur Torah. That play can make a difference of either there's going to be a terrorist attack. Or it's going to be a miracle. That's the difference. If you look at mitzvot like that, all of a sudden you become more religious without doing anything. Just simply by considering what's the action. What are you going to do? Mitzvah or not mitzvah? Second thing is, a person has to look at the time that's going to... Everybody has to go upstairs. Everybody has to go to Shemaim. Some people go up there early. They go there young. Some people, Baruch Hashem, they live 120 years. Everybody goes at different times. Now, if we're doing a shiur, the Yilu Nishmat, that obviously means that everybody here has knows somebody that died. Now, in Shemaim, there's no mercy. That's what Rabbi Yisraeli Misalan said. When people meet Hashem in Shemaim, they're not going to know him. Why? There's no mercy in Shemaim. Mercy is only here in this world. What's mercy? You make a sin and Hashem doesn't kill you right away. That's mercy. That's mercy. In Shemaim, there's no mercy. There's only judgment. You did good, you get rewarded. No good, you have a problem. Details of the problem, we have entire movies about it, lectures about it, all the details. But the key is to know that at some point, everybody has to go up to Shemaim. And the first question, the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat says, first question they're going to ask you, did you conduct your business with emuna, meaning when you were doing business, you sold paint, you built buildings, you had a print shop, you were, uh, you know, a, uh, fixing uh, mufflers, you were a plumber, whatever you did, diamond dealer. Did you do it with a shem in mind? Meaning, did you think every transaction the customer comes, did you think a shem is watching you? Did you think a shem is watching you? Oh, you thought, no, no, Hashem is in Shemaim. He's busy with the angels. He's busy with like running worlds. 
He's too busy for my little transaction for uh, $9.99. He doesn't care that I charge this guy $10.99 really because he wasn't paying attention. If you did your business without Hashem in mind, you already failed at the first question. So the first thing that a person has to think of, at some point I have to answer for how I did business. How did I do business? Am I a thief or not a thief in the eyes of Hashem? Second thing is, HaKadosh Baruch is going to ask you, what did you use your time for? So oh, I, I worked. I made a lot of money. Fine. You made a lot of money. Why did you make so much money? So I could build a house. Okay, but you lived in this house for, let's say, 120 years. After 120 years, somebody takes the house, and most likely they're going to forget you even existed. You built the house. You, you built a mansion. 87 rooms. One for every million that you made in the last few months. Right? You made a big house. At some point, somebody else takes your house. It's not you anymore. They're not going to put the, your name on the house anymore. The Chovot HaLevavot already wrote a thousand years ago. Why does a Kadosh Baruch Hu give rich people that are reshaim, that are wicked, money? One reason is because it's a form of punishment. Why punishment? He gives them whatever reward they did for whatever good they do in this world. In this world, because they have no share of the world to come. He gives uh, money, reward to his haters in this world. But the second reason is, is because HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to keep giving shifa, keeps giving good to this world. He has to keep giving money to this world. But sometimes the person that he wants to give it to is not available yet. He didn't do the things that he needs to do to get the money. He's not ready for it. So Hashem has to store it somewhere. So the Chobot HaLevavot says, Hashem takes the money and he gives it to some rasha. Why? He's going to be the bank. The rasha, the wicked guy, he's going to be the bank. Why? He's going to hold the money. He's going to use the money to build a building, or build a bridge, build a city, build a supermarket, build all types of things that give him headaches, that give him problems, that give him no joy whatsoever. You ask him, how's your life? Oh, my life is miserable. Why? He has diabetes. His kids are, uh, you know, uh, marrying men and men. They, uh, the girls don't even know what way is this, what way is that. He has so many problems. He's not even sure if his wife is loyal to him. How much money does he have? Oh, like, like sand. He has money like sand. But Hashem gives him a lot of money, even more money. Why? He says, because I need a bank. I need a bank to store the money. Why? Because one day a tzaddik is going to come. He's going to need a store to buy some, kids, some things for his kids. So, now he has a store. One day, a tzaddik is going to have to cross the bridge. So I need somebody to build a bridge for the tzaddik. Here you go, I give him the money. One day, a tzaddik is going to have to open a little office so he can do his business. So I need somebody to build a building. So the rasha is the bank. He's the bank for the tzaddik. Now, a person says, okay, fine. I wasn't the tzaddik, but I wasn't the rasha. I was in the middle. I was in the middle. I didn't spend all my time learning the Gemara. The books are still brand new. But I know uh, Parashat Shavua. But were you happy about knowing about Parashat Shavua? Yeah, I was very happy I knew Parashat Shavua. The rabbi would say something about what Rashi said and I knew. Okay. Were you happy about the fact that you made $10 million in your life? He says, tell you the truth, Hashem? Not really. How come you weren't happy about making $10 million? Tell you the truth, Hashem, I was actually kind of disappointed I only made $10 million. Because the nerd, remember, you guys remember the nerd from the beginning of the show? The nerd, he made a billion dollars. And I was smarter than him. I got better grades than him. He was ugly. He was short. He was tall. He was black. He was white. He was all the wrong things. And he made a billion dollars. And I can't believe he made more money than me. Oh, so you're telling me that... The $10 million that you made, you weren't happy with. Why? You wanted more. Even though you knew that at some point you're going to die. Even though you knew that at some point your life is going to end. But you weren't happy with it. But knowing just the parashat shavua for an eternity, for a life that's forever, that you were happy with. How come? What's the explanation for that? What's the answer for that? Who's going to be the best salesman in the world is going to have an answer for that one. You are happy with 
10 million until you realize your friend from class had 100 million, had a billion. Then you weren't happy. You wanted even more. But to just know the weekly parasha, you settled for that. It's like, no, it's enough for me. I'm okay. I don't have to be a rabbi. I'm okay with just knowing the weekly parasha. I'm okay with that. For that, you were okay. How come you aren't uh, jealous that the rabbi knows every page in these gemarot by heart? How come you weren't jealous of that? How come you aren't jealous that there is a five-year-old that knows more Torah than you? How come you aren't jealous of him? Five years old knows more Torah than you. Why weren't you jealous of the five-year-old? Oh no, he was a genius. No, he wasn't a genius. A regular kid. Five years old knows more Torah than you. Already finished half the Shas Mishnayot. How come you aren't jealous of the five-year-old? You aren't jealous. But the guy that made a billion dollars, you were jealous. For what? For something for a temporary life. Temporary life, you wanted everything. Permanent life, I'll be okay with just a little bit of Shabbat. That's the question that Kadosh Baruch is going to ask every single one of us. We're not talking about the guy that's an idol worshiper. We're not talking about the guy that kills people for a living. We're talking about basic people that are keeping the basics of the Masoet. Why were you happy with the basics? When it came to the Torah, but you weren't happy to the basics when it came to money. You always wanted to build another company. You always wanted a bigger diamond. You always wanted more. Ambition, when it comes to money, endless. When it came to the Torah, it's in a lost and found department. Why? HaKadosh Baruch is going to ask us that question. The third and final point is... If a person thinks somebody just passed away only a month ago, if you would have asked them, do they want to pass away? They don't want to pass away. Nobody wants to pass away. Everybody wants to live. My rabbi, God bless him, Rabbi Faim, his two-year-old daughter, less than a week ago, didn't feel good. They took her to the doctor. Doctor said, you have to go to the emergency room. There's something wrong. They went to the emergency room. The emergency room said, there's something wrong. We need to perform an emergency surgery or else in a matter of moments, she can die. They do a surgery. They find out that the appendix has a hole in it. And the hole was so horrible, the whole appendix blew up. How big is the appendix of a two-year-old? Maybe the size of, of my finger. Tiny, tiny two-year-old girl. Little appendix, rare situation. She wasn't eating uh, glass. She wasn't eating people. She was just a two-year-old little tzaddikah. Appendix blew up. Appendix is this big. The hole in the appendix is even smaller, microscopic. But this tiny, tiny little hole, life risk. In a matter of moments, if they didn't get, if they didn't have this miracle to take her to the doctor, and another miracle, the doctor would identify that this is not a cold, this is not a virus, this is an emergency room. And another miracle, the emergency room would actually take them and take it seriously. Especially with all the hatred of religious people in Israel right now. They say they're, they're very stringent about hating religious people. They're very good at that. Hating Arabs, not so much. Why we heal the Arabs, especially the ones that do terrorist missions like October 7th. But the religious ones, we don't like. So this little girl, appendix this small, a hole that's even smaller, cannot even see with the naked eye, life risk. She's still in the hospital, and there's not the shame, unless there's going to be an open miracle, she's going to be in the hospital for a long time. A long time. And most likely going to need a second surgery. If there's not a miracle. So now, did anybody wake up in the morning and think about, thank you, Kadosh Baruch Hu, for the appendix that works? You have an appendix. All of you have an appendix. Unless you removed it. Most people have an appendix. Did you, when you woke up in the morning, you say, thank you for the appendix that works, that didn't blow up, that doesn't have a little hole like the two-year-old girl? Did anybody even think about their appendix? Does anybody even here know what the appendix does, Bechlal? Most people just heard the appendix for the first time in their life. Last time they heard it was in biology class. They forgot everything as quickly as they learned it there. 
So you have something in your body that if there's a tiny little hole in it, a person can die in a matter of seconds. I remember my, one of my first surgeries, something similar happened. And the doctors told me, you have to have a surgery. I said, okay, fine. When do I schedule it for? They go, right now. Why right now? He said, well, because if not, you're probably going to die soon. I said, how soon? He said, probably in an hour or two. I said, wow, you're full of good news. Full of good news. Next thing you know, I'm in the hospital for a month and a half. For something I didn't even know was bad. Something I didn't even know existed. You wake up in the morning, you don't say, Ishtabach shimcha la'ad, that I have an appendix that works. Ishtabach shimcha la'ad, that my stomach works. Ishtabach shimcha la'ad, that my eyes work. Do you guys know you have two balloons for free? They're cameras, they have a storage system and a clean system all by itself and it works for free. Did anybody wake up in the morning and say, thank you, Kadosh Baruch that my eyes work and they clean themselves? Because even a camera, if you pay $25,000 for a camera, there's a camera called RED. It's a very high, high, uh, high resolution camera. It's 25000 and up for a camera. It's not a person. You could buy people for 25000 But you could also buy a camera for 25000 now, 25000 for a camera, but if you ask, does the camera clean, clean itself? No, Mapito. For that, you uh, have to get a cleaning person to clean it professionally. But you have two cameras with endless recording, cleans itself. Every time something gets dirty, a little water comes out automatically. Where does the water come from? The same exact system. And then after the water comes, there's an entire machinery to wipe it off. Every few seconds it happens. If you didn't have it for even one minute, all of a sudden your eyes are dry. You don't have it for an hour, you start going blind. You start losing your sight. Did anybody here in the morning wake up to Akadosh Baruch thank you very much for having this camera system we call eyes? Most likely no. Why? Because we just take it for granted. We live. We live. But in reality, when you look at a two-year-old girl and she's in the hospital with all types of tubes coming out of her body, you start thinking, wow. Thank you, HaKadosh Baruch that I'm not this little girl. Thank you that I'm not in the hospital. Thank you that I don't have to have a surgery. Thank you that my body works. Thank you I don't have these tubes. Thank you that my eyes do work. Thank you that my ears work. Thank you that my stomach has just enough acid to digest the food, but not too much that it burns holes in the stomach. Because technically, if your stomach has a little bit more acids than it's supposed to, it starts making holes in the stomach. You put meat, you take meat, you take ice cream, you take chicken, whatever you eat, all of it gets dissolved in your stomach. Technically, you should ask the question, how come the stomach doesn't dissolve itself? You ate steak, the steak is meat, right? Goes in the stomach, it's gone. Chicken, gone. Ice cream, gone. Candy, gone. Everything is gone. How come it doesn't eat itself? It does. It actually does eat itself. But a Kadosh Baruch Hu has a special mechanism in it that it regenerates faster than it eats itself. But if you have a little bit of extra acid in your stomach, that's when, when the ulcers come. That's when you start having holes in the stomach. Did you say thank you to a Kadosh Baruch Hu that your stomach doesn't have too much acid? Did anybody even think about too much acid? Last time some people heard acid was maybe when they were doing parties and uh, raves. What acid? But the reality is, Rabotai, we should say thank you to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for everything. So now we have three different reasons. One, we're not really happy with the amount of money we have. We want to be more ambitious. At the very least, we should be a little more ambitious when it comes to being Jewish. Being Jewish because we got the Torah. You're not Jewish because your mother is Jewish. You're Jewish because your great-great-grandparents at Mount Sinai said yes. Now, seven Ishma. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you want the Torah? And they said yes. If they would have said no, there wouldn't be anybody. Why? The mountain would have dropped on them. Because when HaKadosh Baruch Hu asked them, do you want the Torah? The mountain was on the air. On top of them. He says, if you say yes, then you could consider this mountain like a chupa. Like a chupa, you know. If you say no, here's going to be your burial ground. I'm going to drop the mountain on you. So they said yes, they right, there was a right answer. It worked. But the reality is, why did it, what, when did we become Jewish? Right there and then. 
It wasn't because our mothers were Jewish. We became Jewish because we received the Torah. Receiving the Torah is not enough because a lot of people receive the Torah, but they become uh, different religions. Receiving the Torah means you learn the Torah. So if we're not happy with the amount of money that we have and the amount of success that we have and the amount of uh, uh, you know, uh, business we have, at the very least, we shouldn't be as happy with the amount of Torah that we have. We should ask for more. We should do more. Number two, the value of mitzvot and sins, it's not only about you. Even if you don't want more. Nobody here celebrated October 7th. Nobody here was happy that the Arabs murdered us. Everybody was crying. Why? Because you want to help Am Yisrael. So even if you yourself don't want the one mitzvah that you do today, let's say, for example, when I go, we're going to eat something. Somebody's going to eat, you're going to do a bracha. That mitzvah of a bracha can change the entire scale for Am Yisrael and help all of Am Yisrael. Meaning it's not just about you. Even if you don't care about yourself, you care about your kids. You care about your grandkids. You care about your wife. That mitzvah, the next mitzvah can save their life. And number three, if we really think about it, not only does Hashem not need us, but we owe Hashem endlessly for the things that we don't even consider. Most people, when they pray, their favorite part is what? Everybody says, oh, it's my favorite part. Everybody knows that part by heart. And people do the whole thing. They open their hands. They have a different thing. No, no, no. Rabbi, you shouldn't do this way. You should do this way. You should do this way. Why? So you catch everything as if there's something falling. Everybody knows what's the way, what's the way. But in reality, why do they know this part? Because they're thinking about money the whole time. So you thank Hashem for money. It's good you thank Hashem for money. It's good to thank Hashem for money. But you should also thank Him that you have an appendix. You should also thank Him you have eyes. You don't thank Him they have legs, that they work. So it's a thing of all the other stuff. Meaning that when you start thinking about all the things that Hashem gives you, you realize that you're in debt. Big debt. Huge debt. And at the very least, we should start doing something about it. Maybe not pay the whole debt today because it's not really possible, but at least you should make some payments. Learn an hour of Gemara with the rabbi. Learn an hour of Chumash. Listen to a Shio Torah instead of the Shtuyot on the way to work. Here in New York, if you want to go to work, you have to drive an hour. It doesn't matter if even if you're going to down the block. You have an hour a day in the car minimum. An hour a day minimum, you can finish the shas every seven years. So we owe Hashem, we want to help Am Yisrael, and most importantly, we're not going to have an answer of why we weren't happy with the amount of money. So surely, we shouldn't be happy with the amount of Torah. Be'ezrat Hashem, each person takes this to heart. Because this is the emet, and it helps all of us do tshuva. Thank you very much for having me. Shem v'echot chol. Amen.